choose to discuss with you. The first issue is how can we change the world with IT solutions? How can we help the agribusiness to find the right solution to increase the productivity? To answer these questions, we invited the, probably the best speakers in the world from real business, of from the, of course, um, from the technology-driven companies, and we do hope that we will get the answers about both questions. But before I will do this, I just want business face friendly around. It. Probably you know that um, by 2040, the world's population will increase up to 9 billion people. That means 2 billion people more. If we do think about that roughly 1 billion people is still underfed, then we have actually huge challenges for agriculture. How can we solve the feed and food shortages of the next years? The answer is very simple. Innovations and increasing productivity. And the many researchers says in, say in that connection that one of the countries which has the best conditions to increase the productivity is currently Ukraine. Ukrainian agribusiness over the last 20 years has shown actually very good results in terms of increasing productivity, but also increasing export. Ukrainian agriculture is currently one of the global players on the global markets. So last year was another one big record year where Ukrainian agriculture has exported agriculture goods for more than 17 billion US dollars. So Ukrainian agriculture is actually on a good way to be the big player for next year. year, year. Definitely can we be more competitive? How can we be more productive? And uh, there is again the simple answer. So innovations and high tech. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to introduce our panel discussion for today. So let's start with a uh, lady, Yulia Poroshenko. She is uh, the founder of AgroHub and a managing partner of AgroHub. Uh, she has studied in France with a background of math. So she knows she has to, she used to work in a different consulting company. So she, she, she sees the agribusiness from different perspective. Um, then we have Michael um, if you know a little bit about the English Premier League, then you know probably that in English Premier League they have like big clubs like Manchester and Liverpool, etc. But sometimes um, they are Leicesters, they become champions. If you take a look on the machinery market, we have three big players John Deere, Case New Holland, and also um, Echo. But Horse is becoming recently the champion. Why? Because they are so innovative and my company, IMC, is buying the machines and is so happy because Michael Horsch knows exactly what the farmers need. And all the needs he transfer into the technology which we which use. Thank you for coming, Michael. Um, then, uh, Tobias Mena, I think I don't need to introduce Bayer company because it's a world leading company in terms of technology in the crop sciences, but not only in the crop sciences. Uh, Tobias has worked in Ukraine for five years as a, a country manager and uh, knows the Ukrainian agribusiness quite well. So, but he is also quite experienced in the world technologies and currently he is at Bayer again. He is responsible for the global uh, uh, digital farming uh, pro uh, uh, yeah, project. Thank you, Tobias. Um, the one participant who is uh, still uh, on the way is Yuri Kosyuk. Uh, Yuri Kosyuk um, does not need uh, to be introduced as well because he is the uh, owner of the, um, the major owner of the large Ukrainian agriculture company, which is one of the top uh, companies in Europe right now in terms of production of chicken and uh, different cash crops. We do hope that uh, he will join the discussion of the uh, next few minutes. So let's start with our panel. And I wanted to ask firstly, Yulia. Um, Yulia, you, you studied in France. You did different jobs in, in, in different businesses. 
Why right now started a new project AgroHub? Why agriculture? Why? Thank you, <coughs> Alex. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, <coughs> AgroHub uh, was designed as collective impact organization that um, um, brings together different players, bring together uh, business companies, uh, technology developers, media, knowledge brokers, in order to introduce uh, innovation into agri sector. So you're asking why uh, IT and why agro? So as you know, uh, when technology comes to um, agriculture, it makes it possible to obtain fantastic results even if there is no um, good um, natural conditions. And there are numerous ex examples in the world of such. Um, let's take Israel with its uh, drip irrigation or Iceland with its cherries or strawberries that are cultivated thanks to thermal energy. Oh, the best example is the Netherlands, relatively small country, but again, using technology, using innovation, it managed to become the second largest food and uh, agricultural products exporter in the world, following just uh, the US. Unfortunately, the penetration of technology in Ukraine is quite low. According to different um, experts, it's not higher than 10%. But even without this um, powerful, innovative component, uh, Ukraine managed to get uh, very impressive results. As uh, Alex mentioned, uh, our achievements, uh, Ukraine is number one in uh, sunflower oil uh, production and export in the world. Uh, our products can be found in more than 170 countries. And um, this is mainly uh, to, due to several factors, and one of them is our um, um, fruitful soil. The best soil in the world, the black soil, occupies in Ukraine more than 300,000, around 300,000 square kilometers, and this is size compared to the territory of the UK. So, as you see, the innovation could make miracle. And can you imagine what could happen if in Ukraine we will introduce um, innovation in full? So that's why we created AgriHub as a platform, as a bridge between innovation and agricultural sector. And here in Davos, we are also a bridge between uh, Ukraine and, um, and the world. Um, because uh, the AgriHub was founded in Ukraine. We know um, the specific of the country. We know local companies. But on the other hand, uh, AgriHub team has international background. For example, one uh, our, of our knowledge brokers, the company Civita, is uh, present in several countries in Europe. And um, talking about myself, I have uh, more than 10 years experience in international companies such as General Electric, McKinsey. I studied as uh, um, Alex also mentioned in INSEAD. So it, here in AgriHub, we speak the same language as, as uh, our international uh, partners. So uh, who we are looking for? First, if you're an investor, look at the um, Ukrainian agricultural startups. AgriHub selects the best solutions and make them even better. Uh, through our partners, through our uh, agricultural companies, we let uh, these startups to um, try their prototypes, to test their prototypes on real farms and fields and get the best feedback, expert opinion on what to improve. And uh, one of our initiatives that we just launched together with Radar Tech and one of the leading uh, in Eastern Europe agricultural holdings with MHP is MHP Accelerator. And the goal of this initiative is to search, develop, and integrate startups into agricultural sector. Um, so uh, if you are an investor, uh, look at our IT solutions because here in Ukraine, we are not also rich in natural resources. We are also very proud of our creative potential, of our uh, guys and girls who are doing great uh, products. Um, 
uh, our IT um, sector is also booming. Uh, we have in Ukraine more than 100,000 IT specialists, and we expect by uh, 2020 um, uh, to have more than 200 uh, IT specialists. Uh, secondly, if you are a startup, if you are a company and have a ready solution for agricultural sector, AgriHub can become for you the entry point. Because uh, we know um, uh, local companies, we know what they need, we know who is a decision maker in, in the company. And we partner with uh, Ukrainian Club of Agricultural Business, so we know many companies. So if you have Again, if you have a solution, come and we will do our best to connect you with the companies to get win-win result. And finally, and finally, we are a platform, uh, innova innovative platform. We, uh, we um, collect uh, ideas, innovators, uh, and we want to become a part of global network. So we want to connect to such platforms as we are. So let's connect. Uh, let's talk, let's act, let's build bridges. Thank you very much. Uh, Mikhail, I don't need to ask you why agriculture, because uh, we have discussed last time when we met in, in uh, Hanover and Agritechnica for three hours about the games for kids based on farming. So, and decided and decided that the games for kids based on farming, they will help actually to make our world peaceful. And I do believe that it's really true. But the question is actually not about the you know, games right now, maybe later. So the question is about the technologies. As I said before, Horsch is really driven by technologies. And you produce the technique and equipment which is really exactly suits to the, uh, to the farmer needs. The question is on, you have different countries, you have different uh, experiences. What is Ukraine right now in terms of high tech in agriculture? Something between? U.S. In, 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 in Africa or somewhere in the front, uh, what, is, what is actually you, your opinion on that? Well, <laughs> what do you want to hear? Um, of course, the good news. <laughs> um, I'm afraid uh, to tell you that, um, um, that Ukraine is probably, when it comes to large farming operations, one of the most progressive uh, in crop farming and also now in, in, in livestock farming too, it looks like, but mainly crop farming, this is where I can talk about. Um, one of the most progressive uh, uh, countries in the world. I compare it a lot with, um, actually, there's not much you can compare it with, actually, when it comes to large operations. Um, you can compare it only to maybe Brazil and a little bit of Argentine, but there's maybe only a handful of organizations as large as some of the largest organizations in your, your country. I would say, if you, if you talk about farming operations, 100,000 hectares plus, um, there's maybe 100, 100 operations in the world, 100. There's maybe two in, in North America, there's maybe six or seven in Brazil and Argentina, and the rest is between Ukraine and Russia. And when it comes to who, where are the most successful ones, it's definitely Ukraine. Uh, so I'm afraid that you are not, you're already getting to the leading edge and what you're talking about now today, especially when it comes to digitalization, I call it the SAP of agriculture. That's what you're working on. That um, I'm afraid that goes even on beyond that. You know? And um, <coughs> um, it looks like, I mean, I've seen you develop for the last 25 years, Ukraine, and I, go, I remember when I, when I first came to Ukraine 25 years ago and saw this uh, uh, cooperative farm, this uh, cocos and cooperative farms transferring into private enterprises, and then the first uh, investors came and they made a flop up, you know, and they just um, uh, lost all the money and the next ones came in. And I look at now the new type of managers and investors, and mainly Ukrainian investors. That's the interesting part. It's not outside investors. That's another thing. It's it, the, 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 what I see in Ukraine, which is a phenomenon, uh, which is actually quite unique, is that most of the most of the, the growth uh, of these large operations is coming from within. It's not like outside investors come with money and management. It's actually from it's actually built from within, and that's what actually makes it even more exciting and more dangerous for us outsiders to look at Ukraine, especially from a farming point of view, because well they're going to run us out of going to run us out of bit out of business if they're going to continue like what they're doing right now. So I say, well, I better make business with them now, and not uh, pr uh, stop them to do what they're doing right now. But anyway, uh, yes, uh, I think that's what he wanted to hear. Um, uh, uh, you are on the right track. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 
uh, hopefully we will hear the same also from the buyer. Um, but uh, the, the question is actually not about the uh, crop technologies and the buyer again. The question is digital farming. We do talk a lot about that. And uh, I've just uh, taken a look on the, on the uh, election program of uh, uh, Mrs. Merkel, and there was a point of digitalization, a kind of ministry of digitalization in Germany should be created over the next years because a lot of jobs should be should be uh, taken away actually due to the digitalization. So digital farming from here up to, I don't know, in 10, five years, uh, what is what is your idea, how it will look like? The digital form of the future created by buyer. First of all, digitalization is, is nothing for experts. It's for everyone to discuss. And I think that is really great news. So um, to have an opinion, to form an opinion, and to enter into a discussion, you don't need to be an expert around digitalization. That's very different. So um, when it's about legal topics or chemicals, you should really be an expert. For digitalization, that is not necessary. So from that perspective, I think we also need to be cautious on, on the ministry part. Digitalization is requesting the creativity from all of us um, because it enables us to put things new together and to change paradigms which have formed our thinking for the last couple of thousand years. Let me give you a quick example. I don't want, I'm actually very proud that today here not everyone is wearing the same shirt and the same trousers as I'm wearing. I am very proud that not everyone drives the same car I'm driving. I'm also very proud that everyone uses the same crop protection products I'm using because of resistance. Mm -hmm. Now, in digital, this is very different. I do want that everyone uses the very same product. Think about WhatsApp, think about LinkedIn, think about Facebook. We are damn proud that everyone uses the same product. So a very different paradigm. So, um, and there are a couple of them which are totally changing the way how we need to think. Mm -hmm. And this is opening up creativity and new space. How that will really work out for Ukraine, don't know. Um, I'm also here really to find out a little bit. I, I know two things need to come together. Entrepreneurial spirit and creativity. And from my five years in Ukraine, I've observed both. And therefore, I believe we are all, Ukraine, as everyone else, is here on the starting point, but on a very good starting point. Yeah. Thank you. I just uh, read uh, in, in uh, I think it was Forbes, U.S. Forbes, uh, the last issue, and it was exactly about uh, uh, agriculture and high tech. And the Forbes, U.S. Forbes, has uh, written very nice article about their different stuff like vertical glass houses, etc., etc. But they have mentioned few issues. The first one was that the investments in high tech in agriculture last year worldwide they were like roughly 1.5 billion U.S. dollars. And they do expect the value of the of the of the sector is up to three trillions U.S. dollars. Do you believe in that? Um, to me, the really good news. Also, if if I, I hope there are a couple of people here, and I know there are people in the in the in the room here who are very creative, who are very knowledgeable, and who hopefully will start their own company, hopefully in digital agriculture. Here is the good news, guys. You do not need a lot of money. It's all about creativity, everything else you can rent free of charge almost. If it is AI, if it is computing power, if it's market access. Count on your creativity. Don't look at the big numbers. You do not need that type of investment. The market is huge and the transformative potential is huge. And therefore, there is really this possibility really for everyone here. Yeah. Oh, three trillions US dollars market value in agri-sector of the future. Agrohub, which part will you take from? <laughs> uh, our main goal is to um, develop um, companies, uh, IT companies, startups, and help um, uh, the, the companies, the, the uh, business agricultural to become more effective. So uh, we hope that by uh, introducing innovations into our um, partners, in our partners' company, uh, will help them to uh, uh, grab as much as they can from this uh, volume. So AgriHub is just um, uh, is just um, uh, like helping these companies to become more efficient uh, and uh, get more profits. That's good. I, I do predict that the Ukrainian um, high-tech agri sector will have uh, over the next five seven years like a share of five 
to 7 billion US dollars. That's my personal prediction. Uh, we will see over the next five years if it happens or not, but I, I think it will, will happen. So, Mikhail, um, what, what is your idea about that? Three trillion US dollars, the market value of the agriculture in the future. Well, <laughs> it's all about uh, food shortage uh, at right. the end. Uh, and um, if, uh, if we still continue uh, feeding the world the way we have fed the world the last 50 years, that means we've always, through um, uh, techno technological progress, which now digitalization will also enhance that, uh, to always be ahead of consumption, uh, then maybe it's not as big, but I don't believe in it. I believe rather in that the food shortage thing is something we completely underestimate. Um, it also has to do with the wealth of the world. So I, think, um, uh, I want to believe that uh, the value, like you've been talking about, what the agriculture is worth in the future, is more like what you said than uh, than um, what uh, what some may want to see happen. Uh, uh, in terms of ha having cheap, future, cheap food available for, for, a long, for a long time. I don't think so. Um. But also to predict, uh, if we discuss about the food uh, shortages, there are also different opinions on that. Some people say, okay, we do have enough food in three, five, ten, <coughs> even 20 years. Some of the people say no, because we need to feed really like uh, three billion people more. Uh, but at the same time, the people say, okay, the consumption uh, of the food will be also changed, so the people will become more vegetarian. They will have fish, for example, etc., etc. Yes, um, I think uh, we should not we should not underestimate, like we've been discussing this between us and between you, us, us too, but you, you and us too, uh, that there could be a poss that there's also a high chance that uh, there's diet changes happening. You know, through more awareness of what is healthy, what is not healthy. I say less sugar, less uh, milk products, less uh, meat products being used, uh, and as a, as, a, as a consequence, uh, we eat more uh, whole grains, pulses, and whatsoever. Um, I, I also believe in that, but that doesn't mean that that is basically solving our It's main of quality food is going up, yeah. and we have not yet uh, found a way to describe what is quality. We have issues with uh, with uh, GMO products in our world, especially in our Western world. You know, uh, like non uh, GMO soybeans is a big a big uh, issue with us. Where the society thinks we should not have it anymore. I have a mixed feeling about it, whether the society is right or wrong. Yeah? But the society at the end of the day is a buyer, not us. You know? um, and on the other side, uh, uh, when it comes to real health, uh, what is health healthy for your body and what is health healthy for the society. Um, I think uh, there's, a no, there's another big challenge for us farmers with technology and digitalization as well to actually uh, improve uh, food quality. And it starts in the field. It doesn't start in a factory. It doesn't start in, uh, in a supermarket. It starts on the ground and it, start, it starts with new methods, with new thinking and with new approaches. And I think there's, there's, there's tendencies in this world that we, we, we have to be aware of. Uh, and, it's, and it's actually driven by, um, uh, for instance, I always use the example that uh, you have probably heard about flexitarians. The flexitarian movement is one of the biggest movements in the world, bigger than the organic movement. Nobody is yet aware, no, not many people is yet aware of it, but maybe many of you are already flexitarians even without you knowing it. But did you know that the biggest driver, one of the biggest drivers of the flexitarian movement is Silicon Valley? The Silicon Valley is full of flexitarians. They believe in it. And uh, so that means they could maybe change through the digitalization, through cell phones and whatsoever, they could change our diets. Michael, and that disrupt could, 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 could you please like elaborate what are, what are flexitarians? Who are flexitarians? You are one. Because, yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 we talked about it yesterday and uh, I heard uh, about this uh, first time. Even I am a flexitarian, but uh, uh, f for me it was a new concept. Well, I didn't invent this word. It's, uh, yeah. it's invented by uh, uh, food specialists and supermarket chains and whatever. A flexitarian at the end, is a, it's a movement uh, where people decide uh, either by uh, being convinced about it or actually driven into it by manipulation that they eat less meat products, less milk products and less sugar. That's basically what it is. But it's not vegetarian, it's not uh, vegan. 
it's only less. And, it, and there's a trade-off. They eat more pulses and, and whole grains and whatsoever. That's actually what it is. It's very simple. It's a very common sense uh, movement. And maybe most of you guys are in here are already vegetarians, flexitarians, without knowing it. But that means the more people do this, go in this direction, and it's driven by digitalization, uh, we should be aware of, as, as producers, as farmers, and for machine manufacturers, that this could be maybe one another, another challenge for us to adapt to this movement. Could be. I'm just. Are I'm not. You I'm not well, I, I was just thinking. I'm. I'm eating something different every day. If that also makes me a flexitarian. <laughs> you probably. The way you look, you probably want to. Um, Alex, I, I. I have a question here into the room. Into the into the room. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I was working with great passion for five years in Ukraine, and and um, I was repeating myself day in day out um, that the key success factor of Ukrainian agriculture is a fertility of the land. So I would want to discuss what is the success factor and, and unique selling proposition of Ukrainian agriculture in the future, differentiating it from other producers. Um, oh, oh, well, he, he hit, uh, he hit uh, the nail on the head. Um, yes, uh, uh, by historic means uh, or by nature, Ukraine has one of the best soils in the world with the Genosim soils. But the way it's been farmed, not the recent 20 years, the recent 50, 60 years, it's actually diluted. You know? Ukraine has diluted some of the value of its soil. You know, it's lost its humus content, lost some of the nutrition. And um, some of the fertility uh, you need to increase even more your production, you need to get it back. The way you farm it now, actually you're actually on top of it. Actually, actually, you improve soil structure, you improve, but it also means that you have to invest a lot more in fertilizers, a lot more in rotations, a lot more in this and this and this. Um, and that's also something, actually, digitalization will help to, uh, to discover that and to site-specific, very, very accurately apply fertilizers and make sure wh which soil is in a good shape, which soil is in a good shape and so on. And that's why, again, now we're coming back to digitalization, where digitalization could have a big impact to improve the fertility again what it needs, where it needs to be, where it was maybe 50, 60 years ago. Yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm just um, I wanted to add a few words uh, for those who are not knowing. Uh, I'm CEO of uh, IMC Agriculture Company. We do operate uh, 136,000 hectares of land in uh, three regions of Ukraine, um, Poltava, Chernigiv, and Sumy. Uh, I'm telling that because I just wanted to show you how the soils uh, play a role or not uh, play any role actually anymore. So we have in three regions like 70,000 hectares of corn. The most fertile soils are in Poltava. So like c classical, traditional Ukrainian black soil. So last year we have had the yields in Poltava with the same technology like in Chernigiv, six tons per hectare, unfortunately. In Chernigiv, with a classical sand, without any kind of fertilization, we have received 12. So the question is actually, how can we get 12 ton on sand and 6 on black soil? The answer is very easy. Right now, the technologies are very good in terms of seeds, uh, plant protection, etc. But the one difference is precipitation. And I think due to the climate change in Ukraine, we have a huge challenges also for the farmers because I grew up in a small village in the north Ukraine. When I was a kid on the farm, I've never seen sunflowers or soybean. Never ever. But right now, we have all the fields with sunflowers and soybean and corn due to the climate change. The only one answer. So I think we do face huge challenges uh, and, and, and it will also increase the role of precipitation of the technology of the staff who is going to increase the productivity of the next years because the only soil is not the answer anymore. Not in Ukraine at least. Yeah. So, Yuri, Yuri Kasyuk, please. Hello, I'll be here. From, from that side. Yeah, please, we have a place for you. Please, here. Yuri. Oh, yeah. Yuri Kasyuk, the founder and the chairman of MHP, 
uh, one of the largest producer of uh, poultry meat worldwide and uh, one of the most efficient companies worldwide. So, Yuri, we have discussed here about different stuff, especially about the high tech and agriculture and uh, the future of agriculture in the world. Uh, and we have discussed about the agri hub as well, agro hub as well. So, you are very successful in your business, but right now you've started to invest in uh, high tech. Just tell us why, please. It's quite simple because uh, because I like my country. I would like to develop develop you know new, new generation, the people maybe businessmen in our country as a company MHP is based for 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 their growth and and their you know set up in a, as businessmen, not more. There's nothing special. That's for me. That's rather a charity project uh, rather than the, the business. We don't see any any maybe that potentially will be a business, but. I would like to develop this, this businessmen, small small guys, who who are very active, who are very smart, and who who would like to do something in that country. We are, you know, for them as base for 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 their for their future. That's only 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 one way, only one one reason to do that. We have discussed also here that the uh, agriculture sector of the future will uh, have the value of three trillion US dollars. You don't, yeah. I have no idea about that. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what does mean trillions of the dollars because because who knows about future, you know? The Mikhail knows. Mikhail knows? <laughs> Seems to me not. We have expertise from, from the past, but our future expertise is completely zero. So. Yeah, please, we have questions from the floor, so please, we have like 10, 15 minutes for that. <laughs> Do you have a microphone? Yeah, one, two, yeah. Do you have, a, have an, yeah, I'll give you my microphone. Thank you very, thank you very much. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, we, we do hear, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. This is just a comment from my own experience. I'm a businessman from Azerbaijan. Um, we uh, started investment in the greenhouses in Azerbaijan. We started with 10 hectare, grow to 30 hectare. And the, the question of agriculture, I think, has two dimensions. One is for the country, the macro picture, what happens about the import, the export, the innovation and all that. But also, there's a very interesting question of how much do people benefit from it? So after I made my greenhouses, after 30 hectares of very high-tech greenhouses, uh, I had this idea. I said, why don't we democratize this knowledge of how to build greenhouses? We are the sole distributors of uh, seeds, which are now buyer seeds in Azerbaijan. And we set up a seeds company. We said to buyer, to we look, we want to distribute your seeds. So we set up these small offices around Azerbaijan in different regions. And we said to the farmers, if you buy seeds from us, you will have free knowledge, access to all of our knowledge. And so we started to set up these small offices, but then they start to ask questions about what kind of vitamins should I use, what kind of fertilizers should I use. Before I know, we have small markets, like a supermarkets of all the products that a farmer needs in each region of Azerbaijan, with specialists which are there all day, so the farmer can come and ask questions, excuse me, I have this problem, how can you help me? So we, we took the knowledge of building a greenhouse by ourselves because what happens in Ukraine, in Russia, in all of our region, in CIS, you have two, three big companies, they come, they build 200 hectares, they say we solve government's you know, uh, agriculture problem. But again, it's the same thing, how do people benefit from it? And we really had a great case study. We now have hundreds of farmers who are small farmers, they buy seeds from us, we go to them, we talk to them, they can send us a picture via WhatsApp. They get an answer immediately what the problem is. Technology helps. They can call us via WhatsApp. It's free. It's, you know, there's internet is everywhere. They suddenly have a resource to go to, and it's not government. It is private. It's based on a relationship. And really, it's done wonders. I just wanted to share this great experience with you that sharing high tech, you know, a fertilization process is high tech now. Uh, you know, vitamins are very high tech. But Taking this knowledge to every single farmer in the country is also very, very important. And I love Ukraine. I have, uh, you know, the CEO of all my operations. We have 10,000 employees. He's from Ukraine. I have a great bond to the country. 
And uh, I would love to repeat the process in Ukraine as well if the opportunity arises with buyers. You know, I don't know what the setup there is there now. But we really, really saw great benefit in Azerbaijan. People are really happy. And hundreds of farmers, their lifestyle changed. And it's very interesting. It's a never-ending story. They say, well, can you help us sell it now? So now you have to help organize the sales part of it, which is distribution. And you, your company just grows organically by itself. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. I just wanted to share the joy. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, it's a very interesting experience. And I would love to connect with you so you can tell more about it. Because for us in AgriHub, uh, it's also very important to collect these best practices and uh, what we call use cases that we can distribute through um, our other members of the community. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, great discussion. Um, my question is the following for the joint panel. Where does the panel believe will the biggest impact lie of digital or high tech? Will it be precision planting? Will it be deciding where to plant the seed? Which soil? Uh, when to irrigate? How much to irrigate? Um, or will it be from digital breeding? Better understanding the molecular pathways within the crops? Um, maybe it's a combination, but I would be very interested to hear the opinion of the, of the panel. Yeah, let's collect a few questions and then we will actually answer that from the panel, yeah. Okay, yes, please. So yeah. Next, yes. next question. Um, yeah, so um, well, I, I do share the enthusiasm about the um, driver of um, uh, te technology driver for driving up uh, efficiency and harvest yield and profitability of the Ukrainian farms, particularly the large-scale farms. But I just want to mention, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the first, uh, let's say, 10 years ago when, when we started seeing these large-scale operations listed on the market, um, besides MHP and Cornell, and maybe one or two others, uh, many, many companies disappeared. A lot of money was lost, actually. And I think corporate governance was one of the major problems. Um, and so I'm wondering what, you, what you're thinking about the future um, of these operations and their, let's say, uh, position vis-a-vis -vis to uh, well, foreign and, and local investors. And maybe something to think about is the, um, if you look at what's happened in Latin America, if you take the example of Argentina, it's a very interesting example, not only it's a, well, we can talk a lot about the farming there, but about the, the way that investment in farming is really a, a household name. You have hundreds of little investment pools where people put money in, you have a stable yield, and it's like, it's like a very mainstream way for people to invest in that country. So it's maybe something to think about for the Ukrainian world. Yeah, thank you. Who is going to start? Yeah, then I will we'll start. Uh, just a short comment about the um, knowledge transfer D, uh, T, or through the, the distributors. I think, I think the times are definitely over when the distributor or dealer sold just a product. Uh, I think around the world is the same tendency that the dealer and distributor, they sell usually the knowledge. And if you go to the US farmer and ask actually the US farmer, what kind of seed do you use? Usually they have no idea because they believe and they do strongly trust to their uh, distributors. They know exactly what do they deliver, why do they deliver, they did deliver the knowledge. And I think we have also to learn about that in Ukraine as well, especially the small farmers. And also the distributors, they need to learn why the knowledge is so important and not just the selling of the product. Everybody knows that the buyer product is good, but there are a lot of products on the market at the same time, probably cheaper. And the distributor is going to be the person or the, the company who is going to give the, comp yeah, the, the, the knowledge to the, to, the, to the farmer, I think. So that's obviously clear so uh, back to the question so let's start with the last one size I mean uh, you know I, I studied in Germany 25 years ago and did my PhD there and even 25 years ago everybody discussed about the size especially in Germany the country which is dominating uh, by small farmers everybody told me in a university even the professors that the size actually doesn't play a role the small farms are beauty and the big farms are disaster. They will not survive because of the uh, sunk cost, because of the institutions, because a lot of stuff. But 25 years ago, usually, I do ask my professors in the university in Berlin, come on, the farms, they do still exist. The farms are efficient. 
and they have per perspective, and they have corporate governance, they do learn. Some of them, they've disappeared. Yeah, clear, that's a story. But some companies like Nokia has also disappeared. So I think agriculture companies, they have no more traditional process of developing. If you think that the agriculture in Ukraine, or actually the, the transition economy in Ukraine started only 25 or 27 years ago, so we are still on the way. I do believe that we have in Ukraine different companies, different companies um, which are large, some of them are small. I do believe that will survive efficient companies, innovative companies, or the companies who, uh, which implemented the innovations in, in, in the farming. So that's very easy. Do you want to add something? And the, and the, the question from me, yeah, I mean, honestly said, I don't know. I think it will be a mix of, because the times are so changing so quickly that just to say that it will be hybrids or that it will be green, uh, greenhouses, so I don't know, that, that probably would be naive to say. I think, I think that uh, it will be kind of a mix of. Yeah, and I want to build on uh, what Alex just said, that the <coughs> area of ag tech innovations is quite fresh, quite new. So uh, we need to test some um, uh, technology and uh, see what, what are results. And uh, you know that they say that the farmer has 40 chances because in the lifetime of the farmer, he can uh, have a four, uh, 40 crops. And uh, we need to be very careful because not all technologies are like mind-blowing and uh, give uh, the best results. So for that, uh, again, we will, um, uh, in, for example, in Ukraine, we are going to uh, make a pilots and tests and see what are ROI for certain uh, technologies. Sorry, you know, it is uh, quite simple. Efficiency will indicate who is right, who is wrong. You know, that uh, in our case, then, then, then larger company, then the more potential, uh, the po more potential they have. We have uh, the maybe the, the smartest engineer, we have a smartest IT technologies be because we, we're ready to pay more money to them and we have, we have a good place for their growth and efficiency. If you are talking about what is right, what is wrong, just efficiency will decay. Uh, have a look. Toyota, 50 years ago, it was nothing. Today, Toyota, Toyota is, is good. Where is General Motors today? Answer for a question. question. Tesla, maybe. Fantastic, because I have a different opinion, so thank you very much <laughs> for, for having that our discussion. Um, I believe um, scale is not a good determinator for efficiency of agriculture in the future in Ukraine. That was clearly in the past, as was access to capital. Digitalization will lead here to a more democratization of good agronomic decisions and will not determine and, and efficiency will not be driven by size, but rather how, a, how, how quickly t uh, farmers will be able to embrace new technologies, especially in the space of digitalization. Farmers or, or big companies? Uh, it doesn't matter, but the, the necessary size to being successful is constantly decreasing. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to just uh, come back to wh where digital digitalization will take us. Uh, so far, I have gone through myself uh, um, in our egg industry the last 20 years through three phases of precision farming, it was called, you know, uh, like yield mapping, uh, site specific uh, soil testing and whatsoever, and then taking decisions of that and then and then trying to farm a farm, especially crop farms from an office. And I must say, up to now, it all failed. Digitalization, up to now, what it did, it made actually the more a farmer was digitalized, the less his, the, the, the less his profits were. That is a fact. That doesn't mean that if we're going to continue in digitalization, it's gonna, if we're going to end up with the same, with the same uh, uh, experiences. I don't think so. I think we'll learn from what we've gone through, the, the three phases in the last 20 years, from this type of precision farming and digitalization and so on, and with the means of, with the use of AI, for instance, which brings a complete new aspect to it, yeah, and other, other tools like um, this whole processing of uh, satellite pictures and so on, this is fantastic, which we didn't have 10, 15 years ago like we have it today. So I can see that the next, the, next, uh, the next level of digitalization that's coming, especially for lar now and going back to larger operations, now we, we can't define what is large and what is small. I agree, you know. Uh, uh, I don't want to be in this business about uh, explaining what's big and small. At the end of the day, I agree, efficiency is, 
is what what uh, what uh, what is most important. Wherever the, whatever size you are in, the efficiency counts, and the efficiencies scale of uh, uh, the, the the scale has uh, definitely an issue has definitely an effect on efficiency. Not always, but def uh, but uh, in many many situations, yes. But anyway. Um, the next level of digitalization with AI and processing uh, satellite pictures uh, will definitely become a better tool for decision making, not running farms completely from remote. Forget that. And we also discussed that the human factor uh, with new digitalization has to also grow with it. The, the, next, the next generation of managers of farms, they have to, be, they have to be educated. And it's better to educate them on site, where you develop also the digitalization, than you bring in something from remote, from other countries, and try to adapt what works in the States, try to make it work in, in, in Ukraine. I don't think that's, that's very smart. Some pieces, yes, but not all of it. So I agree the way they're going, that they try to take some of their digitalization in their own hands and work together with Bayer and others. Um, or to learn from them, and at the same time, build a next generation of farm managers that use digitalization for, for better, as a better management tool, but at the end of the day, still, become, still be farmers, be better farmers. Because at the end of the day, if you forget about being, being a farmer, understanding soil, understanding what's going out there in the field, the digitalization will not help you much. So it goes all along. OK, there was a question. Yeah, here. My name is Alexander Landi. I'm chairman of Eurocom Group in Switzerland. And, um, well, we have quite a lot of clients in Ukraine with whom we develop new fertilizers. And I agree that it's, it's not going to be only digitization or, or any specific thing which will develop the world to feed the 8 billion people population, but it will be innovation everywhere. So what we are doing is, in, well, in our labs in Germany, in Norway, uh, in the United States, and other places, we are developing new products and new fertilizers. And these are slow release, microgranules, and so on and so on. And um, I think that has to be combined with digitization. It has to be combined with the imaging of, uh, well, fields and uh, at the end of the day, de de determining what is the best application of best product to soil to specific crop. That's what we are trying to do. Now, my question to you would be, is that something which AgroHub would be interested to develop? Or who else is in Ukraine the best platform to discuss those issues? Is that the Agricultural Rada or any other association? Who are, where should we be active? We have four agro centers in Ukraine. Again, some of our clients are here, but we would like to know how. Thank you much for the question. I was uh, actually going to um, make a comment that uh, innovation agenda of AgriHub is not only digitalization. Uh, there are more than 24 or 25 areas that are uh, related to innovation and in agriculture. So it's agrobiotechnology, which you are talking about. It's digitalization, automatization, innovations in corporate uh, management, um, and, and, and many more. So so um, we are doing now, <coughs> right now, a big research. Uh, me being a consultant, I, I always start uh, with uh, diagnostics. So first, what we are going to do is diagnose the sector in terms of of what are the innovation priorities. So what we do through the series of um, uh, interviews or surveys and scorecards, we are going to understand uh, which priorities are there on radar for agricultural companies in Ukraine. And uh, for example, we did this uh, for MHP and uh, agrobiotechnology is one of uh, the areas that are on uh, innovation agenda for the company. So. Um, Yes, we are going to also include this area into our uh, agenda. In my case, advice only 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 your clients are your promoter, and you should do, you should connect with direct con the customer, and that's all. Rest of them, uh, it doesn't work. That's rather you know rather rather uh, dreams and and folk. And I think Sorry, you leave. No, I think I think if you have uh, big clients, then everyone, the large company, Ukraine has a uh, R&D department, and that means uh, you can uh, use uh, the facilities of uh, large companies just to implement u new technologies. I, I mean, I do speak about IMC. We have uh, roughly 2,000 hectares 
only for uh, for uh, tests and, and then uh, pilot projects. So there is a huge team which is actually occupying only with uh, with testing of different stuff. So you can uh, easily uh, work with them together. But I do completely agree with Yuri that uh, your clients is the best answer on your product. If they if they are satisfied, then it's actually yeah. There's a question. Я думаю, это такой прямой перевод. Как коррупция влияет на инвестиции, правильно? Может ли она влиять на инвестиции? Potentially yes, but you know, because so many, so many smart and and right people today they are involved rather in the in the black side of the business the black side of the official official management or something else they you know that great potential for the for our growth and then less these people will be involved in that black side then more smart manager will be will be in the right side and the same the the the, the money what they are uh, what they put in the on the table or on the on the bed they will uh, just they will take take away for the business as investment it will be huge in a huge investment potential for you for for the country but despite of that believe believe me that today we have the best place ukraine one of the best place to do business in europe i do business in in different country in europe and and uh, asia and middle east believe me we are very very good place to do business safe good nice people enough people smart people who are able to to do success thank you i do agree uh, with Yuri and i wanted to say just a few examples uh, how the government has uh, fought that their corruption in the country over the last few years um, there are a few issues with in agriculture and farming there was uh, the number of uh, examples of corruption the first of all was actually the uh, tax office and since last year their taxes uh, or their VAT reform uh, from for the export is automatically so that's no corruption in that system and I, I, I do I do believe that is actually will be also the future so no corruption in VAT secondly land there was also the big issue for agriculture who gonna to land to lease the state land right now that's also organized via auctions Believe me, there is no corruption. You can apply via auction for the land, and if you propose the good price for the land lease contract, you will receive it. And the third one is also the issue of uh, the banks. Right now, if you are a good company, if you have transparent balance, if you have a transparent audit, you will go to the bank. That, that, that actually doesn't matter which bank, but you will get their credit, or the money for your business, also with reasonable, uh, uh, reasonable rates, like 4.55% in US dollars. So that means right now the conditions for doing agribusiness in Ukraine are quite well. The other one question is on the profits or profitability or margins. And in Ukraine and farming right now, they are quite high. And if you go to the different countries in Europe, Romania, Hungary, etc., you will never ever have such margins like we have currently in Ukraine. And for that, the potential investor needs to take in consideration the uh, probably the kind country risks. But you have country risks on the one side, and the second one, you have actually the high margins. Very easy. And the decentralization as well help us. Uh, you know, in, in the, our fighting this corruption? To me, corruption is a subset of governance. And in regarding governance, Ukraine has a tremendous chance. We are seeing a paradigm shift which is possible to move from a compliance-based governance system to a performance-based governance system, which is especially positive in, in the area of digitalization. 
And if Ukraine is embracing this better and faster than other places, it can clearly differentiate, especially also here to countries comparing to, East, to, to, to the European Union. Thank you. So, was a question? Uh, I got a brief question for Yuri Kusuk. Thank you for joining us. Um, every time I go to London, I see many investors there, and uh, when we speak of Ukraine, those investors are not yet looking at Ukraine. But they always tell me that it looks like Ukraine is opening up, and they always mention two sectors that they're looking at. It's, uh, it's energy and agriculture. Usually it's agriculture, which is number one. And uh, your company has been immediately mentioned as an interesting potential company for investment. So congratulations on this. Now getting to the question, uh, you were one of the four pioneers in Ukraine in terms of investing into technology and making your production more technologically advanced. And I understand why, because you want to increase the efficiency. So my question is, um, how do you see potentially, could you, because everybody's looking up at, at what MHP is doing and trying to replicate, and I of course congratulate Yule on actually starting the Agro Hub because it's a good accelerator for actually creating new ideas, creating new innovations. But what else do you think Ukraine could offer in terms of combining agriculture and technology, and basically how we can use that experience, not only on the Ukrainian market, but actually then be exporting technology as well, not just a finished poultry product or agricultural product. So where Ukraine can become an exporter of this agro attack technology in itself. Thank you. Have a look. Uh, you know, 20 years ago when we, uh, when we set up our business model for the chicken production, we were unique. Everybody, you know, told me nobody in the world are not doing like that. Why you do this? Why you do that? And today, the, the Poland tried to practically replicate our business model. Believe me, the Polish agriculture or uh, chicken business in 10, 15 years will look the same as we, as we have in Ukraine. And all rest of old Europe, uh, you know, are scared about about Polish uh, Polish uh, pot uh, potential in the chicken in, in the chicken business. Okay, we're fine. Uh, the similar uh, similar successful company uh, in the pork and chicken business uh, start to develop their business the same business model in United States as well. And uh, for us, we try to find out maybe something new. That reason why we set up that uh, this this project and, and we set up a lot of new projects as well as new uh, uh, green energy, or you know the the, the smart technology, smart, smart agricultural technology. I don't know. We try to find out something unique and believe us, believe us. We have great potential. We have enough smart people. We have a big base to set up hundreds, thousands of experiment to to find out something new, something unique for the world because we are big place. And we have everything, we have enough muscles, we have enough money, we have enough smart people to, to find out something new. And that reason why we are so, so optimistic, why they, we are so bullish about that. Thank you. So we have time for one or two very last questions. Uh, do you think there are any uh, specific uh, IT technologies that Ukraine should, uh, if Ukrainian agricultural uh, sector should start implementing now to be more ready to the coming climate change, to getting more, uh, having more, uh, uh, like w what you said, different conditions in different parts of the country with uh, like land getting more arid or maybe getting like more water on the other side? So what would be like the, the um, technologies that we could maybe uh, use now, or how could we get uh, ready to it? Michael, you know. Well, <coughs> um, the, the, the fact is when it comes to climate change, uh, Ukraine, it, it, especially the last 10 years, has definitely been affected by the climate change in a positive way. Uh, like uh, parts of Russia, like parts of Western Canada, like parts of Northern United States. It looks like that between the 45th and the 55th latitude in the Northern Hemisphere, the climate change that's taking place brings us warmer winters, more rainfalls during the growing seasons. Yes, it brings us also a little bit more extreme weather, like thunderstorms and uh, heat waves and so on. But as a, as a general, 
This is the, the biggest impact of bigger crops in wheat and corn the last five years. It's a climate change. It's not only technology change and you're, you're becoming better and better, which is also comes on top of that. So when you, when now what is, what is the predictions? If you talk to the scientists, the scientists as a general say, well, climate change will make this world unsafer in terms of being able to produce the, the crops that are needed. So far, it looks like that the Northern Hemisphere, which is in charge of at least 60, 70, 60 percent of all the grain that's being produced in the world, uh, the clim it's benefiting from the climate change. I don't want to. I don't want to be the devil's advocate here. So um, I'm not a scientist. It's I'm just observing. I'm just seeing what's happening. What's happened, especially the last 10 years. And definitely, Ukraine has been a benefiter has been benefiting from the climate change as well as from better management, from better investment, less corruption, and so on and so on. Yeah. And smarter, uh, Alexei, smarter technology, have a look. Last 10 years, we decreased energy consumption per kilo of the chicken, 50%. We decreased gas consumption, 30%. We decreased uh, feed consumption per kilo of chicken, 20%. So then, then more efficient are you are, then, then the higher technology you use, then, you know, they consume less and less. Uh, you know, sources for production, uh, you know, some kilo of something what people need. So, okay, oh, from my side, I would uh, agree that, um, I mean, climate change has uh, positively affected Ukraine. That's clear. Look on their yields, look on their productivity, which has increased. If you take a look on their worldwide and their productivity growth, in agriculture, so Ukraine is among three countries worldwide, which is actually on the leading positions. The other two are China and, and Brazil. And I think if you'll take a look at the next 10 years, Ukraine will be also among the two, three countries which is leading worldwide in terms of productivity growth. And uh, the, the honest to say, the Ukrainian farmers 10 years ago and the Ukrainian farmers right now, there are two big differences, and we say in Odessa. So that's, that's, uh, that's not comparable. The Ukrainian farmers, they knew exactly what to seed, how to seed, when to seed, how to plant, what kind of technique they need to use, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole technological process is right now absolutely different and not comparable with them, which has been even 10 years ago. And can you remember 10 years ago, that 2007, I think, no, it was actually 2003, when Ukraine even has imported wheat from different countries. Right now is Ukraine actually the global player on the market. So I, I, think, I, think, uh, I think there are many different uh, uh, factors which will influence, but uh, climate change is one of the positive, uh, uh, positive ones. Yeah. <coughs> so right now the very last question. You could summarize each speaker. Could summarize whatever was said. Perf perfect. So then, then um, I just want uh, uh, to 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 uh, shortly to thank all the participants of the panel discussion today. Um, I just wanted to say also the thank you very very much to the organizers of organizers of the Ukrainian House and supporters of Ukrainian House, the first ever Ukrainian House in the world. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you have done a great job, and we do believe that will be not the last one. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, la ladies and gentlemen, we have discussed today about the different issues. Uh, the first one was, as you remember, Ukraine as an agropower in Europe, and how Ukrainian agriculture can also uh, um, yeah, contribute to the, to the uh, world increasing population and the feed problems and, and the feed shortages and the food shortages in the, in, in the future. So I think Ukraine is quite prepared for that. I do believe that AgroHub, which was uh, created a few months ago, will be a good platform for new developments, for the new discussions between IT and between agribusiness. And I do believe that Ukrainian agribusiness is on a good way to become the one of the most efficient sectors across the world. Thank you very much once again. Thank you for coming. Thank you for participating. Thank you.